Joining us now is a special guest for this hour, lead prosecutor in the case, Helen Pott, assistant district attorney there in DeKalb County. Helen, so good to see you. Congratulations on a phenomenal job in this case. You brought a lot of energy and just a dynamic closing argument, but outcome is, was to your favor in this jury trial. I want to talk to you about this defendant taking the stand. We only see it in a small percentage of the cases that we cover here on Court TV. And though I know you were prepared for the moment as a great prosecutor that you are, but I wanted to know if you were expecting him to take the stand in this case. Well, I always expected that he would take the stand because he is the kind of person who just thinks that he is the smartest person in the room. And I truly believe that he thought he could weasel his way out of this. However, um, when he did take the stand, I was in shock because the story that he told us was absolutely ludicrous. It had moments to it. I mean, was there any hint in the pretrial motions and what his attorney said at any point before we actually got to trial or even during the trial where we would have known that this was where his defense was going to go? Not at all. And I have been reading his letters to his brother and to his ex-wife for the past couple of years. Um, I've listened to his jail calls. He's always alluded that he had his side of the story to tell and that it would all come out in due time. But that was the first I heard this ridiculous tale. Wow, let's go back to that moment inside of the courtroom. We have a portion of his time on the stand. My mother was crying. She was making sounds like she might be wanting to scream or shout. And as they made the turn on the landing and took those first few steps, by this point, I and the guy behind me who had the gun on my back made it to the landing. He told her to shut the F up and pushed her down the stairs. This monster took this dumbbell and proceeded to bludgeon my mother right in front of me. And she was, she stopped moving at this point. So Helen, I'm imagining you sitting there at the prosecution's table taking notes, whichever way you do it, by hand or on the computer. and. I'm imagining the moments where you must have thought, not only is it ridiculous or clearly not in line with the evidence, but it's implausible, which I imagine would be an exciting moment from a prosecutor's standpoint when you can come up and say, that's impossible. What specifically were those moments for you? Absolutely. Um, you know, the entire story that he told was just so out of the blue. Um, I will say that the only part that I did actually believe was when he talked about the sound that he heard, the excruciating, horrible sound. Um, because I do believe that at the moment where he bashed his mother's head in with that dumbbell, he did in fact hear that sound. So I think that that description was spot on, but the rest of it was just straight out of not just a movie, but a cartoon. It was just ridiculous. You know, you mentioned cartoon, so I have to bring up that cartoon that the defense wanted to use or put in front of this jury. They were successful in getting the judge to allow it in that someone had placed in the mailbox of the victim of the defendant's ex-wife, and they wanted to show the jury that someone else was stalking this family and may have had a motive to kill Shirley Merritt. Can you talk about whether or not the person who put these uh, cartoons in people's mailboxes were was that ever determined who did it did you ever have an inkling of who did it or did you think the defendant did it himself I believe that the defendant created those and placed them there himself um, I truly never thought that any of his Cobb County suspects had done that um, you know I reached out to the former uh, investigators who had investigated this case in in Cobb and it was a consensus amongst us amongst um, some others who were involved in the case that he likely 
created these himself. Um, and he made himself look like a stud in that cartoon, which is just hilarious to me. Uh, it, it jives a bit with the persona that he had on uh, his dating app, the even the age he was portraying and kind of what he was putting out there to get the new girlfriend there in Nashville. Um, there were so many good moments during your closing argument. I mean, you really brought the energy to the courtroom. This jury had to have felt this story. Even though you had the evidence there, you really shared it with them in a way that was compelling. I do want to go to a moment where you turned to the defendant to address him, if we can play that and talk about it on the other side. Helen, did him being a lawyer, him uh, being in the same state bar as you, as me as well, <laughs> here uh, in Georgia, uh, did you feel any sort of added frustration with this case or with this defendant? You know, I was concerned about cross-examining him because, you know, when a, a lawyer knows how to cross-examine or how to answer questions asked by another lawyer. Um, so I tried to keep my cross-examination very tight. Um, I tried to keep it to yes or no answers or answers that he really couldn't wiggle his way out of. But otherwise, it was just like any other case in the sense that, you know, we gathered our witnesses, gathered our evidence and presented the case to the jury. Um, and we're really grateful with that the fact that they have come back with the correct verdict. There was an offer on the table, we understand, from the pretrial leading right into the trial before jury selection started. Uh, but it was, it was life in, am I correct in uh, the reporting that's been on it, it was life in prison without parole plus five years, which is ultimately what he got? Or was there something that was a little bit more lenient in the offer? I actually offered life with parole plus the five years. Um, so in Georgia, he would be up for parole with simply a life sentence uh, within 30 years after the start date of his sentence. And so now he faces, or he, he has been sentenced rather, to a much harsher penalty than he was offered. He has, he has. So life without parole means exactly what it sounds like. He will never see the light of day. Uh, we noticed the family there in the courtroom. I've had the opportunity to communicate a bit with Robert Merritt, who has shared so many good things about the victim in this case, Shirley Merritt. Uh, a more poignant moment in the courtroom was when her nephew talked about her coconut cake and how it would bring tears to your eyes. It was so good. And just her life as a wife, a, a widow, a grandmother. Can you tell us what stands out to you about Shirley Merritt? What's something that's going to stick with you about this trial? Well, I never got to meet Shirley, but I've been with this case for over a year now and have done everything that I can to learn about her. And Janine Minicozzi on the stand described her as a firecracker. And I think that that's a, a really apt description for what I have learned about Shirley. She's been described as tenacious, um, as caring, and as somebody who always wanted for her family to do the right thing and for herself to do the right thing. She was 77 years old. Um, she never quit working simply because she loved her job at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And everyone I spoke to, one of the first things that they mentioned about Shirley Merritt was her cakes. Um, I hear that they were excellent and I'm sorry that nobody will have the opportunity to enjoy them. In this case, I noticed in your closing argument, you did talk about motive, and uh, not that the prosecution has to prove motive in front of a jury, but you said that he wanted to go on the run and that she was standing in his way. Uh, can you talk about uh, you know, the challenge in this case of even stating a motive in front of this jury when there wasn't a lot of evidence, really uh, very little evidence of bad blood between this son and this mother who 
you know, posted the bond for her son. No, there wasn't. There wasn't bad blood, as far as I understand, between Shirley and Richard. However, I do believe, based on what I've learned, that she was quite disappointed in him and his actions, having con committed the, the thefts and forgeries and elder exploitation in Cobb County, Georgia. Um, I think that Richard Merritt is the kind of person whose concern is Richard Merritt and only Richard Merritt. So I think that at that moment when he arrived home from his daughter's doctor's appointment and she was prepared, not happy about him turning himself in, but preparing for him to turn himself in, he realized that this was his chance, but she could have potentially called the police or called Steve Queen, who was monitoring the defendant's uh, GPS tracker on his ankle. Um, and I think that that's why he took her cell phone um, and, and got out of there. Um, I, I think that he was concerned that she was going to call the police and turn him in. Wow. Uh, which they would have found him anyway with his ankle monitor being turned off right. or at least known right. that he was on the run. Uh, the district attorney there in uh, DeKalb County came on our show earlier with Ted Rowland and Sherry Boston, and she mentioned the point that Richard Merritt never said his mother's name, he seemed to not have that emotional connection. You mentioned the fact that he didn't show any real emotion. Any other observations that you made of him during this time of having him there in the courtroom with you and also on the stand? He was very reactive to a lot that occurred on the stand. Um, you know, his being a lawyer, I think that he was really trying to run the show. Um, but luckily, that didn't happen. Um, he he was concerned and very reactive, particularly to the testimony of his ex-wife, Janine. And although I was questioning her, I did see him out of the corner of my eye, just, you know, kind of talking to his defense attorneys and, and shaking his head, nodding his head. Um, so he, he did a lot of that in the course of the trial. Helen, we certainly appreciate everything that you've been able to tell us about this case. We've been watching it so closely. Is there anything else about it that you want to make sure people know uh, the uniqueness of it? I'm not sure if you've been able to hear from any jurors or get any feedback on this case or if there's anything ahead. Well, I think the, the big takeaway is that we're all glad that it is finally over. Um, this case has been going on for six years now, and I think that it, the jury did reach the correct verdict, so I do want to thank them for that. But I'm glad that the family, the Merritt family, will finally have the chance to move forward. So thank you. Such a tragic story for them. They seem very strong, though, in court in making it clear that he is considered a monster to their family. But Assistant District Attorney Helen Pott, thank you again for coming on and sharing that all with us. We certainly appreciate your time.